ونستغفرك ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه واله واصحابه ومن تبعوا الاحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد So today, inshallah, our night will continue our study in the book of Guru Maram, in the chapter of uh, Kitab al-Salat, and uh, related to the matter concerning Sibut al-Salat. So we have covered uh, most of the hadith in this particular uh, chapter uh, relating to Kifiyat al-Salat, uh, uh, as according to the hadith that Allah, rahimahullah, have uh, mentioned. So that uh, uh, we're discussing as Uh, in the order of this particular book of Bulug uh, al-Muram regarding those type of udhiya uh, that is to be said at the end of the Salat. So we have completed concerning matter related to the Salat uh, from the start through to the end and of those things that are attached to the Salat that the author Rahimullah mentioned regarding the Azkar, the various type of Azkar that one can say at the Salat. So it's also concerning some of those Azkar regarding uh, uh, a few that uh, just to clarify some matter regarding the source and uh, some of those ones that are mentioned that uh, there's some uh, kalam or some discussion between the of hadith regarding its authenticity but most of those ahkar, uh, they are authentic uh, so I think ahadith in this particular chapter will can someone try to cover those ones and then uh, uh, the brother mentioned maybe a quick review of some of the things that we have some quick review regarding some of the stuff that we have covered And uh, in the upcoming lesson, then we say as to uh, which is the, which what to cover, what to be done next, what to be done uh, next. Ewa, so we uh, what's next hadith there? Uh, a few hadith remains. We discussed the hadith of Ayatul Kursiya. We discussed that one regarding the Azhar after Salat. So mention regarding mention the hadith that after he mentioned Azhar, Rawah also mentioned an Abi. وما خبرت عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من قرأ آية الكرسي دبر كل صلاة مكتوبة لم يعنه من دخول الجنة إلا الموت رواه نسائي وصحه ابن بان نعم سوى صلى الله عليه وسلم as they say who read the hadith that the Prophet Islam mentioned that uh, the one who reads آية الكرسي at the end of each of the end of uh, every compulsory salat Nothing prevents him from entering Jannah except mouth, death. The dimension Rawahu is narrated by An Nasai, or Sahabu ibn Iban. Sahabu ibn Hibban. Now, so that the important thing regarding the books of the ulama, being able to understand what is written, now, the language that is used. Now, so regarding the hadith, uh, we mentioned that. Uh, The hadith he mentioned here, Rawahu Nasai. Now, uh, and we mentioned regarding An Nasai, Rahimullah, that uh, even the ulama, uh, other muhaddithun, who have compiled books regarding hadith. Now, and his books, one of his books, some of his books are classed, are classified amongst Kutubu Sitta. Sahih? Wait a minute. So, said he mentioned, Rawahu Nasai, what would you? We said that we have some discussion about what he mentioned here regarding Rawahu Nasai, narrated by Nasai. So we mentioned certain things that uh, that needs to be explained regarding when he mentioned Rawahu Nasai. Now, so said one that yes, Nasai, right? A person reading that bit may understand that this hadith can be found in the book of Nasai that is said to be from Kutubu Sitta, which is a Sunan al Sukra. Now, so that Nasai have several books. Al Kubra was Sukra, and Sukra, the smaller book of his, complicated uh, that it is class of Kutubu Sitta. Is that the book that's intended here, or other, or something else? So, by reading this, the person may understood or may take it that what is meant by Rawah Nasai, that this is from his book that is said to be from Kutubu Sitta, or mentioned that's not the case. Now, And sometimes know these things that uh, uh, Ibn Hajj Rahim was ulama of the ulama of Kibar ulama of Hadith. Some even said that you know these Khatm al You have various titles sometimes given to an alim. Right? Sometimes those things, uh, uh, 
sometimes they may use certain type of title, but we have said Mubalaka. You understand? They can somewhat you know to emphasize certain things about a person, but that's not doesn't mean that everyone has to accept it and to be mentioned. Uh, but in Hajj Rahim I mentioned Rahu Nasai. So Salaf now this uh, is to be uh, Ibn Nasai, this hadith, if when it is checked, it is not found in his main books of hadith. But rather it is found in his, in his book concerning he has a book Nasahi Al Amal Wayom Wa Layla a book a book about Askar regarding supplications Askar to be said during the night and the day. Now this hadith is found in that book. Not from his normal books that everyone may said no normally think it will be found in. So that's a note to be noted. And this I will know these things. By sometime, whatever is mentioned there, sometime for the talib to verify the information. Not just to rely all the time that whatever the alim said is automatically correct. But sometimes when you verify, then that's when someone you know, it shows that uh, well, you can somehow open your mind to other things. Open your mind to other things. I mean discover other things. Now, so when a person may do some research, from different research, this hadith is not in a sunnah uh, sunna al-sukra, no al-kubra, but rather it is in Amal Yawm wal layla another book of Nasa'i. And Ibn 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 but not in his traditional book of Sahih. It's not found in his book Sahih also. Now, so uh, that's concerning that particular hadith. Uh, so we go to the hadith that follows next regarding uh, this particular discussion or those uh, hadith that Imam Hajj Rahimullah he mentioned regarding uh, in this bab of Salat so the hadith of Malik Ibn Huwirith Aywa, Nakra Jade Read that, eh? 259, man Yeah, yeah 259 in your book Yeah Narrated Malik Bin Al-Huwirith Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Pray as you have seen me praying, reported by Al Bukhari. Hey, so after Rahimullah, he mentioned his hadith that end concerning that kind of somewhat. He mentioned as uh, a hadith that's uh, in the Bukhari Rahimullah. Sallu kama ra'itu muni usalli. Pray as if you have seen me prayed. And uh, the hadith, as mentioned here, is also written on a, a hadith in the Al Musnad. Sallu, hey, the same hadith is mentioned also in it, that uh, in Al Musnad, but with a different wording. Sallu kama. Taran, tarani, or Tarani Usalli. Sallu, Kama, Kama, Tarani Usalli. So that's the narration inside in uh, Musnad. So they have a different wording. Pray as you see me pray. Uh, but as the hadith, they mentioned the general bill for the hadith. It's not per se to go into, they said, tafasil, the detail regarding how to pray. But kind of somewhat is to encourage, it's concerned about that encourage a person that in your salat, Try to imitate me as I prayed. Try to imitate me to follow my example regarding how I pray as Islam, meaning the Prophet Islam. So it shows concerning, so that's the hadith as somewhat as a form of encouragement. As I said, Al-Bab of Dari Mizan Al-Fi Mizan, Dari Ala Wujub Iqtidabihi. That it shows hadith is compulsory that one should uh, try to imitate the Prophet in how he as Islam prayed. Now, and I mentioned that regarding that from start through to end trying to bring trying to kind of somewhat to uh, follow his, his example regarding every aspect of the Salat now we're all saying the nation is saying that very well and so following his hadith his guidance regarding matters relating to the, the Salat also from the hadith so regarding concerning the thing that he said uh, uh, his actions in the Salat now so follow him regarding all those aspects of the Salat as you see, as he had or, or as he prayed, try to imitate him. Out from the hadith, it shows regarding the importance of sticking to the sunnah. The hadith, it shows the virtue of sticking to the sunnah. And that if any person to be followed in everything, is only one person deserving this. Only one person that is deserving, we said no, full compliance to his action and his speech. And that person, the Prophet is Islam. 
everyone else to the hadith and encourage concerning regarding the salat that main attention and in teaching the salat that we go back to try to see how did the Prophet Islam, how he, did he pray and follow his example uh, they discussed other matters regarding uh, Sallu, regarding matter relating to fiqh, relating concerns and use concerning usul and fiqh regarding Sallu as a fil amr as a form of you being uh, uh, commanded by way of compulsion that we should pray at the proper time pray but bear in mind that aspect of the Salat Ya Ahmad, I said that is wajib, sunnah, mustahab so all of that will come under that umbrella in imitating that awiyya islam that he prayed but not that every aspect of the salat all the actions and all the speech of the salat that they fall under the one ruling they varies none so the hadith gives us a general kind of somewhat uh, command or instruction that we should try to uh, imitate awiyya islam pray and not to be in contrary to how he prayed not to oppose the way that he islam that he prayed And the hadith they mention it also is mujmal. The hadith will say mujmal, it is something which is very general. Just as I pray as you see me pray, and as from that general statement, the details of how the Prophet pray will go through the hadith that we have mentioned before or have studied. So that will give you more of a detailed guidelines as to how or description as to how the Prophet Islam prayed. But this hadith has given us a general guideline that try to follow the exam, is at least as an example regarding the, the salat. From the hadith, it may be taken and may be understood that the hadith is addressing those people who are present with him. The one that he was addressing directly. Sallu, kamara'itu muni musalli. Pray as if the how you are seeing me praying. So that address was yes to the companion, to the sahaba. But as we know in the Sunnah of Fiqh, of no, that address also applies to the entire ummah. So what he addressed to the sahaba, then generally, even though they were the people who were the direct, or the one that he spoke to that, uh, uh, directly but also by extension it applies to the ummah not just restricted to the sahaba also it shows regarding kamara e to muni as you have seen now the important concerning knowledge is taken the best way of taking knowledge is from the person who witness it from the person who witness or sit with the sheikh or the teacher directly so taking knowledge directly from the person who is the witness, who have seen, observed that thing, then that's the uh, ideal, ideal way of taking matters concerning al ilm taking it directly from the from the ulama. So that's concerning that particular hadith in general regarding some of the benefits related to that particular hadith. So so this hadith also that bear in mind that. And that here is also the way of ta'lim, uh, the way of also trying to educate the Muslim, to teach the Muslim regarding uh, how to pray. That uh, So he mentioned this particular hadith that you should follow my instructions and my example regarding the salat. Also the hadith, uh, it shows regarding that uh, a person is not uh, restricted to following others as a way of blindfold on others regarding matters relating to the deen and of salat of the important matters regarding the deen so not per se the person is restricted to follow any person except for the Prophet Islam regarding matters of the deen but we go back to a delil so we'll go back to delil regarding matters pertaining to the deen not per se blind following of others and taking everyone cowl as it is without any form of uh, investigation into what it is correct or maybe an error. So that's concerning that particular hadith. That particular hadith. And here is concerning like Hajj, he mentioned the same thing. Take from me regarding the rights of Hajj. So in this act of ibadah, he should instruct the people directly that they should follow his example. So we'll go to the hadith that uh, follows. Two six zero. Hey, what? 
narrated in Rad bin Hussein Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said pray standing and if you are unable pray sitting and if you cannot pray lying on your side uh, in brackets otherwise pray by signs reported by Abu Bukhari without the final words uh, Aywa. so that's the next hadith regarding uh, this hadith uh, Imam uh, Hajj rahimahullah he mentioned regarding Sifat uh, al-Salat al-Marid So can someone to discuss concerning of those things that a person might, fa- uh, person might find himself in regarding all the hadith and the discussion before regarding a person who prays in a normal way regarding Qiyam, uh, Ruhu, Sujood and all those things that we mentioned before then that's the normal situ- uh, condition a person may should pray but you might find a situation when a person is unable to pray following all those guidelines so you mentioned concern at the end regarding Sifat to Salat al marid of those things that one should consider concerning that uh, how one who is ill uh, to pray uh, so you mentioned this particular hadith Uh, so regarding the hadith of uh, Ibrahim ibn Hussain wa ta'anhu is regarding to give us concerning insight and shows concerning Islam, the beauty of Islam that uh, it takes into consideration regarding situation of said another uh, different situation that a person may find himself in so in the person normally may be a person that is well but also we have those who sometimes may fall ill our people may be of a certain age so they are unable to carry us an accident in a normal manner so this hadith is to kind of somewhat to our uh, the author of Mullah, which to bring this to our attention to show concern the person the faqih, the Muslim, that sometimes I find conditions that are that one has to know how to deal with them properly and not put hardship upon people unnecessarily. And after concerning salah with his position and place in Islam, but also some people due to their condition and circumstance are unable to pray in a normal fashion. So the hadith regarding how to pray in a sahaya when a person is ill, then then this come into, into place. And also the Prophet Islam that he prayed sometime in a case where he was ill. Ali Islam, so he was ill and prayed in a certain manner, so he shows that a person may go through those things. So Ali Islam, so he mentioned of this. So he mentioned a hadith here as in, uh, he mentioned Rahul Bukhari, uh, and Imam Bukhari Rahimullah, he mentioned regarding man lam yutiyak, Qa'idan Salla Ala Jambi. So Imam Bukhar Rahimullah in his Sahih mentioned uh, under the heading, this hadith, in the heading concerning the one who is unable to pray, Qa'idan, uh, not able to pray uh, sitting, then he can pray on his side. Now, show that a person uh, may be on a certain situation that is unable to pray, no one. So as for the hadith, No, not that one. So that hadith was said. So that's a general thing regarding. So the general uh, ahadith, can someone mention regarding that one? Regarding the fiqh of the hadith, that regarding concern that and I mentioned that uh, the person who is ill, according to uh, they mentioned that uh, regarding the person who is ill, or the situation regarding salat of the marid, that it may be of three degrees, three uh, cases that he may fall himself that one, that uh, and you saw the khatim in Qadr Ali, that a person may be ill, but he's still able to pray standing. So the person may be ill, but he's still capable of praying normally. But he's ill. Then that person is for him to pray what? Standing. 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 Hey, standing. So, so the person may be ill, but he's still able to pray normal. But he's got experience that have some illness to that person, then uh, and he can do Roku and so and all those things normally, but he's a bit ill, then it's for him to do so. Because it's still a must upon him to pray standing in a normal fashion. Uh, then you might find another situation where a person is ill, uh, but is unable to uh, is unable to stand. So he's like, he's going through some form of illness, so he's unable to stand. But he may be able so the person uh, or he can stand but he find difficulty in standing for long find difficulty in standing for long so in that case that uh, uh, that person now 
uh, he can start to salat. If he can stand for a while, if he cannot stand at all, then he prays in the next position, what you call a sitting position. If he can stand for a while, can bear it for a while, for a little while, but then after all become difficult for him, he start out standing, then he can at some point and go to his up uh, to the sitting position if he's ill. No? Because he can bear it for a while. So he started with the takbirat in the standing position, then after a while he can sit. No? Uh, so that's concerning a person like that. Or a person who uh, he finds difficulty in standing. Fine, great difficulty in standing. Then uh, he also, then he sits. And uh, if he's, uh, so he will sit uh, throughout, uh, for his salat. And as for the sitting, the person then feels like you have to sit. He can sit on the chair, but at a different akhwal. And the sitting in the chair today we have today, it is something which is a more from as the Nawazi, the people for now you will sit on this type of chair. If they're ill, they will sit, just sit on the floor. Now, but more of more contemporary time, the use of the chair, normal chair become more widespread. Now, so you'll find that books now being written on that, research on that topic. Regarding concerning all the proper way, regarding the use of the chair in the salat. Now, if you find, for example, that uh, just that this is saf al-awwal, or the which of this is the saf. If the person to the chair, the back of the chair to be lined up, your back to be lined with, with there all you can. You understand? So you have that discussion. Where, how to position the chair in the salat. How to prepare a uh, line of the chair in the salat. Where to be placed. Now, something a person in the chair that uh, he starts out standing for a while. Then he goes into us, but when he's standing, he's out there. Not in the self itself. Now, uh, some people say, so you find different things. Some people, they put the chair back, way back, and they stand in line with the self. But when they sit, the chair is affecting the person behind. Now, so I said, the thing is that a person put the chair in line with his self. The general thing that your chair should be in line with your self. With me? So that's your soft, then the chair back would be there. So it's in line, not that it is, the back is sticking out. No? Uh, so you have those masala that are being discussed and a few books now being written on that particular topic. Uh, so to the general, but, uh, uh, and even what chair to be used, which is the more ideal chair to be used, even that's the next discussion. But the person, if he's praying higher then whatever he but he finds that is there then, he pray. But the general thing is that uh, the hadith discussed regarding that uh, the person who is able to can uh, stand, even though I experience of illness he stands, if not, then he prays in the best situation that he's able. And the person can go into sitting position and all those, then the person can pray on his side. Then discuss concerning it to be on the right or the left side. Now, there's nothing that clearly mark regarding right or left side, but they have a preference for the right side. And for example, the person in his bed. No? So if they keep the person like in his bed, he's ill, uh, he's, uh, and cannot leave his bed, then he has to do it on his side, is on the right or the left side. They don't say that to be right or left, but the right side is always more preferred. The right side is more preferred. Sorry. In that situation where a person can't leave the bed, um, is he going to make um Tayyamun or is someone going to do what to do for him? And the matter comes in Tayyamun, the next matter comes in Tahara. No? So it's not that, uh, as a general thing, that if the person, the person uh, that said if he's bedridden away, he cannot leave the bed. No? Then he can make Tayyamun. Mm -hmm. No? Or a person want to make wudu for him or bring everything for him, then that can be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, you know, so, so we assess the situation and then use the appropriate, what you think is appropriate. Mm -hmm. If he can make wudu, but you facilitate him bringing the water and the bucket for him, then he does it. Mm. If he's unable, then he goes to Tayyamun. Yeah. Okay. Type. Start with the, the, the line down. Is it that your feet face the Qibla? Hey, the mention that comes certain that uh, uh, the person face in and face the Qibla. Now his face, so, for example, what's that? And all these are based upon a person's ability. Based upon, based upon a person's ability as to a person's level of illness and what he can and cannot do. Now, uh, 
the area of concern is matter that is discussed more for any time regarding that uh, the person who cannot pray, for example, at all, uh, that in a position where the person cannot, for example, most of the position that we uh, mentioned before, the person, someone, he can uh, maybe lie but still have some body movements. No? But well, about the case where a person is lying, no? and uh, is like fully paralyzed. His eyes, his eyes can't move, his body cannot be moved. You understand? He has no control of the movement of his body. How does the person, as he prays, does use his eyes? Or he doesn't pray? With his eyes, he can't. Hey. So, regarding the matter that uh, the older man concerned, that now some of the older man, older that person, now, if he cannot do all of those things, some of the there's no salt upon him. That there's no salat upon such a person, uh, moving by the eyes, the by the that. For them, that is a form of, uh, it doesn't make any sense. In their view, in their opinion, they see it as something that uh, uh, the Prophet Islam in the hadith he didn't mention about, you understand, that can somehow restrict the baby on your side, the person cannot move his body, and just his eyes, that it doesn't go to that extent of using your eyes, and some hadith I mentioned that, it comes down under discussion, uh, type of thing, so they mention, the person cannot make that, uh, they mention, you know, uses uh, his eyes and all, but they have some type of somewhat uh, objection to that. Now, then you have another view regarding the person, those things, that the person to that, to that level, so that is not compulsory upon him, to certainly with uh, one of the views, if the person reaches that level, then there is no slot upon him. Where he cannot move his body at all. And some mention, yes, he still prays according to movement of the, uh, his eyes, but you have that uh, matter that is under discussion. As I mentioned, Fattakullah Mastatatum, that the person free has planted to the best of one's ability. And they all concern the person that Salat is composed of a person who have the, fac the faculty of Yav Al Akl and Balik. So if you're above the age of puberty, and your body, uh, your aqil, you still have the faculty of your common, of your senses, mean common sense, then you're still obliged to pray. Now, uh, so even though so some said, you know, if the person uh, said, doesn't, cannot move his limbs and all that, then there's no slot upon him. But, uh, see, so have that discussion between the ulama. As for the person who may be in a certain condition where they said, they use your finger to pray, then that's the view. That's the statement of the, uh, of the general people, people who are the enemy, about praying with your finger, moving your fingers, about your finger in your positions. Then the old man, the old man, the old man never discussed that about something as a, an option. You pray, I want to use your finger. You with me? I'm not sure what. That's something that may be mentioned by the general people, but not something mentioned by the old man as an option to be used. Now. Uh, so that's concerning, so that in general the person, uh, so concerning the sunnah, the person uses his finger uh, for his movements, then there's nothing in the sunnah and nothing in the aqwal of the ulama that can somewhat uh, uh, champion that view. So that's concerning and general regarding, so the case concerning a person who's ill, that his situation is different, uh, so he prays in a condition that he is able. And if it means that in forfeiting certain position, then he's excused. He's excused Sharan. The English says, oh, we'll always pray by science. Is that extra bit added by the Uber? Hey, I mentioned it. That's mentioned. Hey, hey, I mentioned some hadith mentioned that, but hadith, there's no hadith that mentions that. It has to say, La Asu. It has no basis in the hadith. Now, to mention the Bible, so that extra wording, it has no mention. La Asu. Laha to write al Bukhari in Burrat al Bukhari, that is not a part of the hadith that come from other narrations, but not from the narration of Bukhari that is mentioned here. And that's of the error, small error that mentioned by Ibn Hajar in this hadith. So the hadith here generally is proof concerns you not know, main point that a person may be in a situation uh, that is unable to pray normally standing and all of the position due to illness. And that illness is a valid excuse that certain ahkam of Islam is that it is, ex that it is excused. Now, so you have an other, uh, a legitimate uh, excuse for praying a certain way due to a certain situation which will be of those concerning illness. 
Aywa, so I mentioned a hadith that comes after, which is still also related to that. Hukum al Mari Ajis and Sujud. Narayya Jabir, radiallahu anhu, the saying of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to a sick person who prayed on a cushion, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, threw it away and said, Pray on the ground if you are able to do so. Otherwise, pray by gesturing signs and make your prostration lower than your bowing. And Bayhaki reported it through a strong chain of the rapists, but Abu Hatim regarded it as Malkuf, singing of the companions. Hey, so this hadith of uh, Jabir Rata Anhu, where Prophet Islam now discussed concerning a person who may be find difficult to do certain position of sujood. So the hadith before was regarding uh, the standing position and what is to be done uh, if unable to do so. This hadith of Jabir is discussed concerning a person may find other position difficult to be done, sujood and the likes. Uh, so the option a person have concerning the person uh, unable, then he can uh, still move of his body part, but rather go into a full sujood, then maybe move of uh, himself, uh, lower his body, but not to the full extent, to the best of his ability. And that will go back and that, those positions best the person that is in a sitting position of the person. Uh, so a person one, the person can stand but may cannot perform sujood, but he can stand, but cannot perform sujood. Now, so what he can, he stand for what he can, and he bends as much as he can for the other positions. Now, but not to pray all throughout, throughout all the salat sitting, and he's able to stand. Now, so the person stands, still stand, and he may move a certain uh, degree in certain movements, uh, but not to sit for throughout the salat, because he cannot, per se, make sujood properly. Now, so what he can do of standing he does, and the other ones, he moves his body accordingly. Then I mentioned Hadith in the Al-Bayhaqi, and uh, Imam Bayhaqi, Al-Bayhaqi, Rahimullah, one of the ulama hadith, one of the kibara ulama hadith. Now, and a very, uh, so uh, Imam Bayhaqi, Rahimullah, and a very important books in hadith. Rahu uh, Bayhaqi, Bissand bin Qawi, Walakin, Sahabu, Abu Hatim, Wafquhu. So Abu Hatim al-Razi, Abu Hatim al-Razi, one of the ulama hadith, one of the kibar, al ulama hadith. In one of the more complex, that is killed in one of the more complicated signs of hadith, which is Ilm al-Ilal. Ilm al-Ilal, one of the more complicated signs of Ilm al-Hadith. That the people who have, who master the science, you can count them on your hand, on your, on your one hand. From the ulama hadith. Ilm al-Ilal. So you have Ilm al-Hadith. Then Ilm al-Hadith has a big umbrella falling into different different sciences. Some of the ulama might, uh, might become well known regarding al-Rijal. But then you'll find out the complicated hadith of Ilm al-Hadith is regarding al-Ilal. Which is the person can detect when uh, hadith, uh, what most may not be able to detect. So things are false in the hadith that most may overlook. And for the person to add that knowledge, mean the person of uh, a great insight in Ilm al-Hadith. And sometimes that insight maybe just leads to a word, a person, but he can detect that there's a problem. Now, uh, in today's time, we find a lot of efforts regarding trying to revive that science, that particular area in Ilm al-Hadith. Effort regarding trying to re uh, revive, regarding Ilm al-Ilal, but it can be very complicated. Sheikh Al-Bani, one of those who had that. So that the Ulama Sheikh Al-Bani, he discussed that matter. Uh, I'll some knowledge of that matter, inshallah. That's not a dinner. Uh, so the hadith here, as we mentioned, that uh, a difference between the ulama regarding the hadith authentic, going back to the Prophet, Prophet Islam, or something which is more going back to the Sahabi. Uh, so that's a discussion between the ulama regarding uh, that particular matter. Uh, the hadith is under criticism, some of the ulama authenticate the hadith based upon other shawahid wa mutabaat, based upon other uh, similar hadith. Uh, so you have that discussion, so you have some ulama after that. So based upon other narration similar to this, they have authenticated the hadith. Some of them will authenticate the, the hadith. 
أنا أنت كوسر الشيخ أبان رحمه قال الذي لا شك في أن الحديث بمجموع طرقه صحيح. So Sheikh Abdul Rahim Allah that mentioned that this hadith with all the different uh, turuk uh, of the hadith, narration of the hadith, turuk uh, more, more detailed, we will do it, different, different narrations uh, that they strengthen each other to the hadith, the hadith with a level of authenticity. In the case that there is some weakness in the hadith, but with other narrations that they give strength to the hadith, it becomes more solid and become seen graded as authentic or maqbool become maqbool understood so the hadith by itself is criticized and may have weakness but other hadith that are similar to it right when they add to that hadith they can strengthen each other and give this hadith strength now that's of the science of hadith where sometimes i find those situations and cases where hadith by itself on its own is weak but with other hadith that are of a similar meaning or with similar other chains, when they are combined, when they surround that hadith, they give it, or when they are put together, they give strength to that hadith. But by itself is weak. But with other things, other narrations, and other isnad chains, when they put with that hadith, it gives it strength in some cases. So that's what he meant by this. Is that clear? Can that happen in the other way around? So can it be that? Other way around? As in if the hadith is sahih, but due to the other reports, can they weaken? No, not, not per se. Uh, so if a hadith becomes authentic, it's not per se weakened by, weak, uh, it can be uh, disqualified based upon other weak hadith. Not the case. Uh, but even though Yahya Masawa, I think the whole man have said that in the they discuss, we said of the signs of the thing that is now discussed in Ibn Hadith and also something a person be mindful of regarding if Hadith, we said the Hadith by itself is weak. But there's other Hadith, other two or three other Hadith that relates to that same topic. Now, for example, the Hadith I will call in the Adhan in the child's right ear. With me? The hadith on its own is weak. The hadith, so you have two hadith. The one about calling the adhan in the right ear and calling the iqam in the left ear. So, with me? That hadith is weak, very weak. So to say that calling the adhan or the iqam in the left ear is a sunnah, then no. Because the hadith is weak. Very weak. So you have another hadith regarding just calling the adhan in the which ear? Right. The right ear. It by itself is weak. It by itself on its own as a hadith, it is weak. But with other hadith that relates to a few other, a few other hadith that relate to that topic, they say give it strength to Hassan. To the degree of, we say Hassan meaning it is acceptable. We come to us at, to a level of authenticity, to a degree of authenticity. With me so far? Yeah. So some may, so the, the issue now going to okay, those other hadith, the hadith of calling the Adan the right is weak. The issue now is for a person say, for a person say that something become uh, strengthened by those other hadith, then you ask the question, what's the level of those other hadith? With me? So the one that are coming that are, that are being used to give strength to our main hadith here, what's their level of authenticity? The one that are used as the one that are using to strengthen it. How weak or how strong or what's their actual degree themselves? If they're very weak, they can't give strength to another hadith, which is weak. So too weak, not in all time, give strength. With me? So the rule is not applied in every time you find a hadith which is weak, they then weak hadith, then it becomes strong. That's not the case. So it's knowing the weakness in those other hadith. If it's very weak, then they cannot give strength to anything, nor anything can strengthen it. Can a weak hadith 
support another weak hadith placed on it being strengthened by another hadith. So it's like a chain, there's one hadith here this week, there's another hadith that's strengthening that one, but it's weak and it's strengthened with luck. Can it work like that? Or? Because, as I said once, that the science sometimes is not one plus one equals two. It's case by case. What's the general? So some people have a general rule that hadith is weak. So said every case is looked upon for its own merits. If you want to use those words yeah. to see one, but the general thing is that. So see those hadiths that we are discussing, those five hadiths. What's each of them individually on their own? What's their weight? Mm -hmm. If they are, some of are very weak, then they are dismissed. And the one that may be slightly weak, I'll how many of them are there and sometimes, yes, they can be strengthened, but sometimes not because there is nothing that is strong enough, strong enough to give it strength. So based upon that, even some of the ulama concerned the given, the Sajjana has said, the hadith, the Kantan, and the, the right ear, the hadith is not to live where it gives strength. So there is no sunnah authentic to say that's a practice. That is a discussion. Or that's a... Uh, so... Uh, so based on that, it's best avoided. Yeah? I'm, not, we're not, uh, I'm just giving that an example. Mm. Now, uh, if that was the case with this example, is it best left? Or <laughs> 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 huh? uh, once we had uh, Sheikh Said the Shuhrah and Hafidullah, he was given a lecture in Usul al Fiqh. Mm. Now, so sometimes in Usul al Fiqh, any science, to make it much more, because sometimes you do something which is, becomes a joha, which is something which is just. Uh, Tangible, there's something that's calling uh, to make things more practical and see more. Mm -hmm. You give examples. So, the example, you understand, is just someone to open your mind. It doesn't mean everything, you understand, we want to go into detail again, uh, whatever. It's just someone to, to open your mind to the idea. Now, let's go to a final, come to a final conclusion. With me? And sometimes the example doesn't mean that everything has to be agreed upon in an example that is given. It's just a somewhat, a somewhat open the person's mind to that particular topic or to what is being discussed. So sometimes the, the, the discussion is not to go into the final conclusion. Can you go into another topic? But just a somewhat to open your mind to certain things to be mindful of. So that hadith, I think that's the, is there another hadith? Or that's the final hadith in this particular chapter. You're going to consider a sujood as sahu. Can you close the word? You're gesturing signs that bit. Uh, by gesturing signs, what do you, you say that meant? Musari. Uh, making your prostration lower than your bowel. So, for example, uh, uh, so you make a uh, ruku, so the permit ruku, then the sujood will be lower. Is that why you're sitting? Except if the person is sitting position, so the person is sitting on the ground, or whatever position the person made, the person on the chair, whatever position that you uh, made as ruku, the sujood should be lower. You with me? So your, your head, your head. In the sense of your head. You understand? So for example, a person go down his illness that he went into sujood and uh, in, in his situation, went into ruku like this. Then sujood would be lower. Now, to make a distinction between both. Some distinction between both positions. So that's concerning, so that's concerning that, uh, and sometimes we in mind, some matters, the Prophet give general guideline, but sometimes it's you, the person who have to do it, become the faqih of yourself, become the, the sheikh of yourself. Only you know best what you can do. So you can describe to the sheikh, but, but the sheikh can tell you, you go 90 and you go 45, it's for you now to make that call, as they say. With me? So some matter, the sheikh sometimes can give you the answer, precise answer to everything. Sometimes he can just give you a principle because it goes back to you in the final call. You say you are sick. In certain matters, you can't do certain things. You know what's best your hal. You say you have a back problem. But I see you moving around a little. So I said, no, that, that's my judgment, but you may understand your condition better than anyone else. And the call really come down to you. You get me? The call will come down to you regarding what you believe and, and, and know within yourself that you can do reasonable well or re what you can do within your ability. So sometimes, and it goes back to the person make the final call regarding certain matters. So with that, inshallah, we have completed the battle of Salat.
Sila to salat. Then the chapter that comes after is Bab Sujuda Sahu Wa Ghayru and other things regarding Sujuda Salat. Those things are attached to Salat in the sense of if errors are made, what is to be done in those cases. So we'll pause here, try to do some uh, revision regarding certain things that we have mentioned. Because many have said, they have, we think they've been said. So it's the first thing regarding what we have covered so far. That there may be things that I have said now that uh, may be incorrect. Now, so for a record, then if those things are incorrect, come back to me. Now, uh, and if it is incorrect, then if it is pointed out, then I, it is to be corrected. Without no blame. Now, and fault. Uh, regarding those matters, uh, or some things I may have mentioned that I misunderstood from what I read. Now, so those things are open and should be corrected if they exist. Now, uh, also regarding so the last thing that we have covered that we started first regarding Bab al Adhan, as certain things are attached to Salat. So, can someone cover Adhan? But before we cover concerning that, in approaching matters of fiqh, now, that, uh, as we mentioned, that the ulama of the Salaf they understood fiqh to meaning concerning fahm, al umur al sharia. Fit to them at a more general meaning, but fit today is more used regarding akam sharia, halal al haram. Now, uh, so I said regarding concerning al madaris, in studying concerning fiqh that we are studying, that we have either the approach that we are using, which is one approach regarding studying a book of akam al hadith. Now, like bulug al maram, where you bring the hadith. And then try to understand the fiqh and acquire the ulama based upon how they understand the hadith and what can be extracted. The positive of that approach, that sometimes in studying fiqh using that approach concerning a book in Akamul uh, uh, Hadithiyah, that not only concerns the fiqh benefit but also you can take, draw other benefits regarding Tarawiyah. With me? Concerning all the problems that would learn concerning mannerism and how to deal with situation and circumstance. So become more, it can draw from it other matters relating to other aspects of day-to-day -day lives. All the problems that did, for example, the Adam man came and urinated in the masjid. Right? Uh, regarding Akam al Masjid. But you can go outside that. Now regarding that and the uh, masjid being kept clad clean, but also concerning things concerning how to deal with matters concerning that if a person does something that you object to, how to resolve it. With me? So with Ahkam al Hadith, you can draw various uh, other benefits that are related to the Hadith. And the second method, and that method is used uh, today, become a popular method, and you have particular books that are also generally used regarding Ahkam, Kutub uh, al Hadith and Hadithiyya. Um, yeah, Umm al Ahkam are one of those famous books that I used. And then you have Bulug al Maram. So the normal, depending on the Sheikh or the teacher, which book to be used first, Umm al Ahkam or Bulug al Maram, it may vary. Now, and any book, as we mentioned in the last lesson, is not some books is knowing the teacher knowing himself. The book is the teacher knowing is this a book within his ability or not? Is it something that he can teach or something that is above him? So the information is given so that the, the person that teacher have to know that book that he's working with or teaching, it is something which is within his ability to teach. Is he himself equipped enough to teach that book? Now, I would say Bulug Maram is a book that has many explanations. We mentioned now easily, you can find easily 30 explanations. Easily. Now, because and, but even though most of those explanations are more of contemporary of the Ulama, of contemporary to Allah, but you have those things that you can use as guide for the Talib. And that depends upon his own, uh, what he thinks he knows. But use those as guide regarding that. 
And then you have a second method. Then when the person leaves these books, of whom that I can, Bulugul Maram, some may go to a third step concerning uh, Al Muntaqa, the Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, who's the grandfather of Ibn Taymiyyah. So, like example, when we were in the University of Medina, that, that was the text that was used regarding studying fiqh in Kult al Hadith. They use Muntaqa, the Ibn Maj Ibn Taymiyyah, with the Shar of Shawkani, which is a level higher than this. So, it would be like this would be like a secondary level, high school level, this book, then a next level to a university level or a college level, then to a university, this would be like a college level, then a university level will be <coughs> the book of Nazi <coughs> Tanya. Uh, it has less explanation, you understand, but knowing how to use the book. Uh, then the second method, then after that book of Manch, then the person go into, they directly go into studying the books of the Sunnah. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, and Tirmidhi. So when you finish that level, then you are not equipped to can now go into the books of the Sunnah directly. You are more now ready to enter the books of the Sunnah directly regarding Islam and all that's attached to it. So you know, when you sit in the lesson of Shaykh Musnabad, as an example, as an example, then you can appreciate more and value the information more. But if you go in there raw, never said any of these things, it seems confusing. With me? So everything of degrees and the more prepared you are, it makes it easier to move forward. But the less you're grounded and prepared, moving forward becomes more confused and difficult. Uh, and then the person can somewhat lose hope cause of confusion. Then the second method of studying fiqh that uh, what we might do before we go to the next chapter bring the book of uh, one of the books of the ulama regarding uh, how they can somewhat uh, 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 regarding uh, fiqh by way of the traditional way concerning the books of the ulama concerning of the books of fiqh Mutun al fiqhiyya but most of those mention that most of the books in Mutun al fiqhiyya that they are based upon a method. Even the Salaf, the Sahaba, and the Tabi'i, Kibar Tabi, didn't have a method. With me, they didn't have a method. So the Sahaba didn't have a method. They were just mujtahid. Those amongst them who were mujtahid. With me, so you can't say I'm found a method of Abu Bakr. He didn't have a method. Or, or Omar, they were just mujtahid. With me. Uh, but the madhahib al fiqhiyya they came after at ba al tari it can somehow become as they can somehow start to discuss matter more and become more structured in terms of abu Anina after that time. Uh, so you find, for example, Imam Malik have a book concerning Muatta. But come up, hadith wa athar sahaba wa kibar tabi'in. That was the madhahib. He himself didn't per se have a book as we know it today in fiqh. That we know it today, how it is structured, that's hadith wal athar. And that was the mindset then, and the approach then. Then later on, then things kind of somewhat, uh, uh, at, uh, at ba'a tabi, then things kind of somewhat start to change. In the sense of a different structure is used. Now, uh, and the structure become more prevalent is regarding the books of Mutun al Fiqhiyya. But then most of that is based upon a method. Five that are referred to the Sunnah still remain to the Ayu Sunnah, or a sixth. So you have the five we mentioned, Imam Abu Anifa as a Mathab. So they have their books regarding the fiqh of Abu Anifa and Aimat al Hanafi. They have their books regarding everything that relates to the Mathab. So they have the entire structure for that Mathab. Books in fiqh, Qawail al fiqh, Usul al fiqh. The aqwal ishihadat of the ulama. So everything is there for that, that serve that method. So it's covered. And all the four al madahib, the Malikiya, the Shafi'iyya, the Hanabila, they are a full structure for their method. So it can be taught. 
Nam, but in the, but having the right bits and piece for those mata 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 to make it more said for you to kind of somewhat can really benefit from it. To really benefit from it fully, they need to have all those things, bits, pieces in place to draw the full benefit. And so those madhahib are there. Uh, so we have those books that are used as a way, as I said, as a method of teaching the people. And as I mentioned, those books are not there to say become a, that, uh, a must book that you have to follow everything in it. So those books are fiqiyah, it doesn't mean, then we said you have the four to cover up the notion, the Hanafiyah, Malikiyah, the Shafiyah, and the Hanabila. Then there's others. The one they call our method concerning the Zahiriya, with the Sheikh Bennett, Ibn Hasim, and others of contemporary time. Uh, and uh, so you have that method there. Then you have one they can someone mention, whatever, said an Istiklaliya. Those people reach the level of each jihad and they have their, their own method. They can someone try to put their form, their own type of method of those Shokani, as an example. You heard of Shokani? So Shaukan Rahimullah of those people can somehow master many science. So he can somehow put his own method together. Not this is a method, but as a to put out his ishtihadat. So, and his book become popular like in place in Yemen. In place like Yemen, for example, the people then of uh, Damaj that they were studying his books to some degree. So the book became popular amongst them, the Mashaikin that part of the word of Yemen. So that's concerning studying our faith. What's the after thing that we can assume our approach is that we can assume use the approach of the, uh, the approach concerning that in studying our faith, whether this way or that way, the way of hadithiyah or the way of fiqh, mutun fiqhiyah, it includes masahil sometimes where there is istihad of the ulama, where there are differences. Where there is difference amongst the ulama. And that will always exist and some Masahil with some minority that they agree upon. But the area where they have a disagreement is not all the time that they're taking things from nowhere, as we have seen in some of our discussions, where some of those Masahil that they differ on, that each alim has a delil or proof that he use. But it's how he use it, and how those who come after understood it, and critique it. So in his eye, he's using it in a way that he thinks is suitable, but someone else may see it different from a person who is equally qualified. And a person who is not said, equally qualified doesn't mean that a person who comes after Abu Anifa can't disagree with his view. Who are you to disagree with Abu Anifa? It doesn't mean that any Adi who is qualified of a level of Ijtihad, he can critique those who precede him. Because it's a mujtahid, and that's of the role of a mujtahid. You have to can make critique of others and sometimes go against them. That's a part of what the role comes with. But in fact, you'll find masahil where there's difference. But of the benefit that we learn from this, not the of the ulama in certain matters, that we sometimes we learn a degree of tolerance amongst ourselves. We learn a degree of what? Tolerance amongst ourselves. That the person that we have said, and those are the differences between I and Sunnah. So rather than always seeing the person who may have a, a, a different view as the enemy, that's not necessarily the case. But is how you can understand his evidence and why you may or may not agree with him. So you learn a level of tolerance. It doesn't mean because you are tolerant, you have to agree with everything the person says. I'm not saying that. With me, but you can somewhat understand where he's coming from and know how to maneuver it different. And sometimes the differences that we find that we discuss, that sometimes we are, are become accustomed to knowing a particular thing a particular way. We have learned a particular thing a particular way. And we can somewhat see that as the only way. So, that's something that we have discussed. 
that we see certain we have mentioned of certain masail that they may the other side may actually have a legitimate view point of view as we have mentioned some of the masail so sometimes we have become accustomed we have become, we have become accustomed to knowing a particular view and those who are true because of or the amount of our contemporary time that we can relate to them we can somewhat accept their thing not knowing that people who before them may have and even with contemporaries of them may see different but we are not that aware of that difference and think that the view that we have is the only view and should only be the view but the other side have a, diff have a view and it may have a point to be looked at and in some cases that we mentioned they may, may also sometimes be the view that may be more correct or have a basis Tali? so I said no the difference is sometimes in discussing these masail is so a part of the cultivation of the Muslim we learn to appreciate that, that, that these views are taken by ulama but it doesn't diminish anything from them I will go overboard regarding them but is weighing out what is being said you become aware that what's the difference so rather than look at the difference as who is saying it why is he saying it why he has come to that conclusion how he came to that conclusion if you understand then you can navigate through the matter and still hold each person with respect and that's even if you're trying to gun down that person so the khilaf between the ulama we said that it serves many purpose it widen your also your thinking span of things how you look at things so as i said your view of the fit become much more wider broader you don't become narrow to the view of fulan or alan become that there may be other people that they also have a saying that what's their view on the matter what's their take so you can somewhat widen your span to when a matter come you know how to approach it what's the call of the ulama in this matter also the, the difference between the ulama you get to know who are those people that their view counts and why why the sheikh view counts on this matter in this particular science in fact why is he a faqih is a muhaddis is he of the level that what he says actually counts in this matter is he of those people you understand so you get to know who are the people who their view counts and those view who may be an alim a sheikh but in this matter his view doesn't really count because he's not on that level of each they had so you're known to put that one of the people in their place in their proper place and order and the people also get us to give an idea concerning who are the people are special in what field and also we ask maybe not you but I tell us why Sheikh Fulan is a specialist in this field no one really knows you can ask me which of the ulama that we have a contemporary time what field he specializes in we don't know we're told that he's a specialist in this field but we don't know why why is he a specialist in this field why so in fact and the difference you get to know who are those people whom they're the people that their view is somewhat counts and why so that is shatawar ta'ala I will mention also the ayyid hadith that can so get a little intense which are proofs I said no that's a little word that uh, the asl of the matter it goes back to the source that you're using and in surah al-fiqh you get to understand that we have more sources than does the Quran and the Sunnah even though they are the asl that give and uh, what's the word I'm trying to find that gives some type of uh, and a clarity but gives some type of uh, legitimacy to other things being used so the Quran and the Sunnah sometimes legitimize using other things as proof with me so we get to this all with fiqh you guys know, the call of sahaba what's its place in fiqh now is it a proof or not a proof hadith out of a hadith when they clash or hadith out of put 
everything in their places. All the things that we still this, um, this matting, Ibn Hajar Rahimullah, that the importance of when it comes to fiqh and Islam in general, knowing the reading of that hadith is something that you, is where you have to start with. You have a hadith, but what's the reading of the hadith? If it's not authentic, then we can't start the engine. If the hadith is not authentic, we can't start, we can't move, we're stuck. So that becomes of the thing that a person has to know concerning studying of fiqh. What's the grading or the level of authenticity of that hadith? If the hadith is something which is, then a person that they know who are those people who are qualified to grade that hadith. Again, knowing the ulama and what they specialize in. So all those things, can say the use of studying of fiqh, can somewhat, it brings everything into play. It brings everything into play. So it can somewhat open the person's mind. Like, sometimes open, we ask the question to go into other things. It means that going into a completely different room. Can okay, mean going into a completely different room. So it's knowing how to put everything in certain order and how to you know, that take things and uh, put everything in its proper place. But think, open your mind that there's many things involved. The Fakhi, when he's there, there's many things that he's working with. But that's in his mind, based upon the principle that he is following. So to know which principle applies to this case. What principle applies to this case? Because he has many things that he can use, but to use